Kaprizov watch scoring edition. Will Karel Kaprizov ever score again? We take a look at the wild through the first few games before diving into the somber discussion of how the Chicago Blackhawks and hockey community failed Kyle Beach. As always, we're created by New Voice Studios, presented by Soda Stick, brought to you by Jim Beam, Better Edge, and State Farm Insurance agent Tony Hoagland at champlininsurance.com. This is season three, episode 97. Be sure to join the Marcus Foligno fan club by purchasing your official tee at sodastick.com. A portion of all proceeds will go toward the Janice Foligno Foundation. And don't forget to snag 15% off all purchases with code BARDOWNBEAUTIES at sodastick.com. At Jim Beam, they know the importance of tradition, like chanting let's play hockey prior to the start of each game or playing the state of hockey anthem after a wild win. This season, raise one to your fan family with the bourbon that invites us all to come as friends and leave as family. Jim Beam Bourbon Whiskey, the official bourbon whiskey partner of the Minnesota Wild and XL Energy Center. Remember, drink smart. Jim Beam Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey, 40% alcohol by volume, copyright 2021, James B. Beam Distilling Company, Incorporate Claremont, Kentucky. Hello, everybody. We're back. Episode 97, nearing that episode 100. Whoop, whoop, go us. It's uh, Jesse Pierce, Alexis Pearson, producer Fred, and hot dog Avery, because <laughs> I told her, for those of you watching the YouTube edition of this, uh, she had to wear her costume because it is the Friday before Halloween that we are recording. She's a hot dog. I got her at the max, which would be a great uh, introduction, except Alexis has never seen Say by the Bell, as I am yeah. Kelly Kapowski, and... I don't even know how to move on from that, to be honest with you. It's fine. I, if anything, I just want to draw attention to the fact that Avery has won the costume contest. No offense, <laughs> Jesse, but baby hot dog wins every time. So, and yeah. I can't wait to show Avery this in like 10 years and be like, look what your mom did to you um, yeah. in Halloween of 2021. And it'll be a good time. <laughs> how we talk about the blizzard of 91. <laughs> she's going to talk about Halloween of 2021 and recording and being some miss to a uh, polarity, but uh, yeah, that's good. What are you guys being for Halloween? Fred, you go first. I'm always the same thing. I went to Munich once and I bought Later Lederhosen <laughs> and I wear it every single year. Is Kelly um, your partner? Like, is well, she dressed? She has only worn her drindle once in Munich and she refuses to put it back on for some reason. You should Fair. make her dress up as a brat and then you guys will be the perfect German <laughs> pair. And, and she'd match Avery. We'd have a hot dog yes. and a brat. <laughs> you can borrow Avery if you want. <laughs> I don't know. I think I'd rather have a beer wench than a brat. Okay, that's wow. fair. Yes, yeah, so that is fair. What about the kids? Uh, Cheetah. And firefighter. Oh, nice. okay. I know. Classics. Kennedy was really upset when we actually revealed Freddie's firefighter costume because <laughs> she thought it was way cooler than hers, and she <laughs> cried for a half hour. Fun. <laughs> kids are kids. awesome. <laughs> yeah. Alexis. Um. So I waited until literally yesterday to figure out what I was going to be for Halloween, and obviously at that point everything is sold out in stores, and it's hard to come up with a costume. So my costume that I came up with, I went to Target, and I was like, "All right, I just need to find something I can build a costume around." They had a pink wig, a hot pink wig, and I was like, "All right, I'm buying." In this and then I built my costume around it and here's what I came up with. I am going to be a love bug, so I, I have wings and then a pink bob and I'm gonna make a heart and put it on like a black costume and I'm a love bug. Get it? Oh, that's <laughs> cute. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of dumb, but that's what I get for waiting until the last minute. So here we. Are. I wanted to be Daphne that's from Scooby Doo, but I couldn't find it and now here I am. So whatever. Um, I like I it. Should have been a hot dog like Avery. Should have been a hot dog. They have adult hot. I have an adult hot dog costume because can, why wouldn't I? You want to give me that real quick? <laughs> yeah, it's it's fantastic. It was. It's, I like hot dogs. I love hot dogs. So that's my thing. I don't know. It's weird. I have no excuses. Speaking of spooky, scary, uh, Kirill Kaprizov has not scored a goal through seven games. Ladies and gentlemen, Kaprizov watch takes on a scoring addition. Alexis, I mean, should we be hitting the panic button? We talked last week at depth about how he might end up with more assists than goals. And mm -hmm. is that a bad thing? Is it not? I argue, yes, it kind of is because we didn't you know, sign him for 8 million a year to get assists. But I mean, right. you can see the panic on wild, wild face, wild fan faces. Dean Evson addressed it again in a uh, post game against the Seattle Kraken saying they need, he needs to figure it out. He can't be, you know, playing out there for himself though either. So what's your mm -hmm. take on uh, the lack of scoring from Mr. 97? 
Uh, it's so hard to be patient when you know the talent that he has. And I, I just get the feeling that if he gets one, it's just going to open the floodgates. Like for the love of God, just give the man an empty net goal or something. Like he just needs to get a goal on the score sheet. And I think that's going to open the door for him uh, to start some more scoring. And it's also hard because like he's getting assists and he's getting really good assists. Like they're, they're good looking assists and impressive plays. Um, and he's tallying those up. But at the end of the day, Kirill Kaprizov was signed to this team to be a scorer. I mean, that's, that's what his role is on this team. And as the superstar of the team and one of the better players in the league currently, you got to score goals. You just have to. And so I'm not at the point yet where I'm like, okay, everybody panic, but I'm, I'm getting to the point where I'm like, if he doesn't start getting at least a goal or two here and there, I'm going to start to be like, okay, yes, it's a long season. Yes. We're only a handful of games in, but at what point do we just say, all right, be better. Like, I mean, maybe we're yeah. being too nice by saying, Oh, it's fine. Take your time. We're fine. Um, as long as you still like us, we're okay. Yes, please. We we are so happy you're here. Um, and I think the fact that the wild are winning, it's easy to be like, okay, it's fine. Take your time. We're doing okay. You know, as soon as you start scoring, you know, take, you know, that uh, scene in SpongeBob where he's like, it's okay, Rocky, take your time where they're racing turtles or something snails. And then there's, I was in high school when SpongeBob Okay. Nineties babies will get this reference. (laughs) But anyway, that's how I feel about Kirill Kaprizov. It's like, it's okay. Take your time. Um, and I think as long as the wild keep winning, he can be allowed some time and space to figure the scoring out for himself if and when the wild start going on a losing streak or they're starting to look bad in more games then I'm going to be like all right now's the time to pick up the pace you're the superstar on this team and we need you to start scoring goals now because the rest of the guys aren't so that's kind of where I'm at right now but it definitely is frustrating seeing him not be able to get goals right now right I mean I think it's it's seven games, right? So I try to always remain cognizant of that. And, and you have to remember too, he's facing new defensive schemes that are really completely honed in on him. So he has to figure Mm -hmm. that out. The frustrating thing is, you know, he's capable of figuring it out. And you know, it's, it's not that it's lost on him. You have to imagine that he's just as frustrated. I mean, we talked about he's gripping that stick tight. He wants to score, obviously like that's his, that's his thing. He's without Matt Zuccarello, who's currently Mm -hmm. in COVID protocol. Uh, Rem Pitlick also, also, not with he's not with victor rask victor rask fred, fred jumping in and stirring the pot sorry. there it is sorry you want, yes do you want to and fred beg us not to fire him today and then he comes on the show <laughs> and does this so you're this really just you poking the bear fred <laughs> yeah yeah fred uh you know but you're not wrong you know i've been really trying to be nice about the victor rask situation right and i understand the frustration he brings however he's somebody that is able to play with Kirill Kaprizov mm-hmm. because he's able to elevate Kirill's play in a sense, right? Like mm-hmm. you need somebody that can complement it. As you saw, the Kevin Fiala Kirill Kaprizov experiment didn't go as well as everybody wanted to, right? Which is an experiment that I've never super been on board. I, yes, I, w- I wanted to see it once, but I knew I'd rather spread out the talent amongst the different lines instead of yeah. putting one power line together. Um, but, you know, it's because Kevin Fiala and Kirill Kaprizov are very similar in the sense that they both want to go to the net and they both want to score. Mm-hmm. You can't have that to have a line be successful. You need a Victor Rask to know yep. his role on that line, which is the very third man on the totem pole with Zuccarello and Kaprizov. Mm-hmm. So you're right. However, I do think Eric's neck though has played that role well yep. as, as well. And he's just a stronger body with that mm-hmm. net front presence. So that's why I like him more than Victor Rask. It has less to do with the, you know, avid hatred of a Victor mm-hmm. Rask as much as it has to do with the uh, Eric's neck playing kind of, a similar role, but a different role, a stronger yeah. role for me. Well, and I think there are two different players as far as where they thrive on the ice as well. Like Eric Sinek plays much better, like down low and in the crease and behind the net and that kind of dirty, gritty area mm-hmm. where you got to be strong. You got to be aggressive um, to make space for yourself and make plays. Victor Rask, I think is much better in the high zone and, and not under pressure. Victor Rask does not work well under pressure. That's why he turns the puck over so much. Mm-hmm. We know that he can skate. We know that he can stick handle. He's not the fastest guy on the ice, but if he has time to do it, he's able to make the play much better. Um, and I think that's the big difference difference is that with Victor Rask on the ice, um, Eric Sinek, let me start with, start with it this way. Eric Sinek draws the attention of a lot of people because he gets under everybody's skin. So right. just like Kirill Kaprizov draws attention for being highly talented, Eric Sinek draws attention because he's a pest. Victor Rask does not draw as much attention when he's on the line with Kirill Kaprizov because everyone is only focused on Kirill Kaprizov. Therefore, Victor Rask gets a little bit more space to work with. And I think that's why that line worked so well was because everyone was like, oh, Kirill Kaprizov, Kirill Kaprizov, and just kind of ignored Victor Rask. And like mm-hmm. I said, he works better when he has space and time to do so. And that was the kind of environment that was created for him on that line. So, um, I think they both 
are good on that line for different reasons. Um, I do think overall, Jules Eriksson-Eck is the better player to be on that line and a better centerman um, for that first line than Victor Rask is. But, uh, I mean, they made it work last year, and uh, so far, Kirill Kaprizov has been getting assists and no goals, so I, I don't know what the deal is. But, um, yeah, it, it is a tough thing to look at. And then you throw Kevin Fiala up there, and everyone's all excited. Like, holy crap, we got two superstars on the top <laughs> line, and they don't do anything. And it's like, Neither well, geez, what do we got to do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's yeah. not limit it to Kaprizov needing to score. Kevin right. Fiala also yep. needs to be scoring. I mean, kudos to Ryan Hartman for picking up mm-hmm. the plaque. I mean, even Marcus Foligno in the past game, Julia Eriksson-Eck obviously scoring. I mean, it's nice to know that there are players capable of picking up that slack. But again, Kevin Fiala, especially a guy who needs to kind of prove himself yeah. and kind of prove management wrong in order to get in a contract extension because he's on just that one year this year. Um, and then Kirill Kaprizov needs to quiet uh, the critics like Drew Doughty and those mm-hmm. who are saying that he was overpaid after 56 games. So I, they'll figure it out again, seven mm-hmm. games at the time of recording. Maybe they'll pop off if we, I like how Alexis had brought that up in uh, our preview. If we keep saying that Kirill Kaprizov is going to eventually, pop off, we'll, eventually be right. we'll be right. <laughs> so we're going to stick with that. As we had mentioned, COVID uh, hit the wild just very lightly thus far. Again, mm-hmm. as of Friday, just two players, Matt Zuccarello um, and Rem Pitlick out, but Darby Hendrickson, it kind of ran the course through the coaching staff, which isn't great. I mean, they're taking all precautions. All the wild players are vaccinated. Um, mm-hmm. You know, a couple of them dealt with this last year, so yeah. they've also been exposed before. So it's, it's going to be what we're dealing with, right? We're dealing with it in every facet of the world. So we'll see uh, more slightly concerning Alex Galagoski injured with an unknown injury um, as well as Dmitry Kulikov, neither sound or seem too serious. Again, this is being recorded on Friday, so I'm sure more will come out over the weekend. Um, but Alexis, how do you think that the, in the small sample size we saw without those two defensemen, how do you think the blue line performed missing two pretty big pieces uh, and how much do you think that contributed to the loss in Seattle? Um, not good. They, they, they definitely struggled without those two guys in the lineup. And even though those are two, um, newer additions to the Minnesota wild roster, they've already made an impact on the team and, and been a big part of defensive success for the wild. And, uh, in that second period against the Seattle crack in the wild were just bottled up in their own zone. They couldn't get the puck out. They were making, you know, weak passes out of the zone and turning it over at the blue line. And if they got it out to the neutral zone, Seattle came right back with it. I mean, they were just not making great breakout plays and they were getting bottled up up, um, which made it really tough for them to get anything going um, in the other direction. And so in, in that sense, when you're missing two of your top defenders, um, that is where I was noticing it the most was just the inability to get the puck out of the zone. And obviously, if you're stuck in your own defensive zone, by the time you get a turn the other way, everyone's got to go off for a line change and you can't get anything offensive going. And then you just get right back to work defending. So it's an exhausting style of hockey to have to play. The Wild ended up coming out of that period relatively unscathed, given everything thing and just right. couldn't find a way to tie it up in the third period. Um, and why so they did, did they come out of that period? Because Cam of Talbot. Cam Talbot, right? Like um, that's, yeah, yeah. It, it's unfair he, to Cam. He, he's been doing better and better. He must be listening to this podcast and heard my criticisms of him yeah. because he's certainly performed better game after game. Oh, he 100% kept the Wild in that game, especially, like I said, in the second period when they needed him to. He gave them a chance to win. So you can't take, a, you can't give the loss, yeah. uh, you know, the blame to Cam Talbot on that one. Um, and the Wild just, you know, second periods on the road can be tough to begin with, and they just didn't look good in that one. So, yeah, they definitely were missing those defenders. And hopefully, like you said, it's not any long term injuries because it's too early in the season to be taking hits like that and have to scramble and, and uh, redefine what your, your lineup looks like. And especially after seeing how the Wild struggle. Uh, that's definitely two guys that I, I would desperately want to get back in the lineup uh, so that the Wild can get back to their winning ways. Right, exactly. Again, they've got another game between now and the release, so maybe they do. Maybe they beat Colorado because they're Central Division champions, according to yes. Alexis. People don't forget, keep the receipts. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, that's going to kind of do it for our Wild wrap. I know I have been placing bets on the Minnesota Wild winning on betteredge.com, B-E-T-T-O-R edge.com. Um, congratulations to our big Kirill Kaprizov autographed winner. Whoop, whoop. Um, I know we also tossed in some Bardown Buttes gear, so that's very exciting. Hope you enjoy. Take some pictures, share it mm-hmm. on social. Uh, congratulations to them. We'll have maybe another giveaway coming up uh, partnered with Better Edge. Again, you get a free $10 when you use code Buttes, B-E-A-U-T-S. We're going to bring back Beat the Butte, maybe get Alexis in on that fun as well. She's just as competitive as I am, I mm-hmm. think, right? Yeah. But less successful, I think. So it's, it's true. Even worse for I me. mean, no, yeah. this year it's been a downward <laughs> spiral for Jesse. Yeah. It is not <laughs> been good you guys I'm I think in today's breakdown of the Seattle game I actually quit my job like I you did I quit yeah 
Yeah. So that's, I did good. that once a couple of years ago too, though. And here I am. So yeah, it's fine. Right. Hopefully You'll make we'll a good find, comeback. We'll come back. <laughs> don't call it a comeback, but it's a comeback. Um, so yeah, don't forget to check out better edge again, B E T T R edge.com. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we are going to discuss how the Chicago Blackhawks and the hockey community failed Kyle beach in the wake of sexual abuse allegations. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. It's hockey season, baby, and the best way to head into a new season is to be fully equipped with all the merch you need to cheer on your favorite teams. Oh, and some Bardown Beauties merch too, right? Right. We've got you covered. Literally. Head over to teespring.com where you can find all kinds of custom design, Bardown Beauties apparel, plus so much more. We're back uh, now in this segment, which is usually reserved for our guest segment. We wanted to take a little different approach and discuss the very serious uh, sexual allegations that Kyle Beach had brought against the Chicago Blackhawks, which the uh, the loss or the recent law investigation revealed that the organization did cover up, did in fact know as uh, Kyle had so heroically come forward and said, you know what, it's finally not me against the uh the world i mean alexis there's so much to dive into and and the fallout has been tremendous as as things keep taking this domino effect after you've discovered that uh video coach brad aldrich had indeed uh sexually abused kyle beach as a player Mm -hmm. and nobody protected kyle and nobody took a stand and, and helped him out and it completely ruined not only his life but his experience in the nhl and and just a terrible terrible travesty that should not happen to anybody at any level and at any time and and in no point should a game ever take precedent over a human and and mm-hmm. their rights and and their um violations so i mean i guess alexis when you know this all kind of started coming out a while ago and it actually kind yeah. of went silent for a bit right i mean it was it was months that this had happened again this took place in 2010 mm-hmm. so even going that far back it's been a decade since this has really been revealed and uh you know alexis what was your initial kind of reaction right i mean i know we always take such a light joking approach mm-hmm. but this was just really something that was so gross and disgusting that it it's hard to move on from a little bit yeah it took me a while to like fully wrap my head around like what how i even felt about it because i felt so many different things and disgusting is one of the words i kept going back to and tragic is the other thing that i kept going back to i mean it is so wrong on so many levels like it's not even just like oh i'm 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 disappointed that this one person did this it is like so many people who did the wrong thing failed Kyle, failed the hockey community, failed the community of people who have experienced sexual abuse and sexual assault. I mean, there's so many layers to this that is so disappointing as someone who loves the sport of hockey to know that this happened in the sport that I love. Um, And it is really a tough pill to swallow to to know that this, that this went down. And I watched the entire Kyle beach interviews. I know most people did. And that was so difficult to watch. I mean, the fact that he came out and was like, all right, I'm going to go tell my story and I'm going to say it, how I experienced it. And understanding that there's probably a lot of people who watched that and didn't believe him knowing mm-hmm. that he went into that, accepting that that was the possibility that people could say, he's not telling the truth or I don't care or whatever. Um, that is like a level of bravery that hopefully most people in this world will never have to understand what that took for him to do that. Um, and I had so much respect for him because I would never expect someone to, to do that, to go out and tell their story like that. And I just kept thinking like, if I was in that position, like, what would I do? What would I do? And I don't know what I would have done in that position to have to have bottled that up for 10 years and watch that team succeed and watch those people succeed. And to know that most people in the, in the general hockey community didn't know that this had happened. And then to come tell your story and have people still say, Oh no, it's fine. That's it's fine. You know, whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and to know that nothing happened for 10 years, I can imagine that pain that he carried with him for that long. So it was, it was a lot, um, to take in over the last couple of days. Um, and I was deeply disappointed that Joe Quinville was not let go sooner or fired sooner or resigned sooner. I was deeply disappointed that he was allowed to coach um, a game after this came out that day. Um, I was deeply disappointed that the Florida Panthers players didn't stand up and say, no, we're not playing for a coach who this happened for uh, fire him. And then we'll play a game. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, there's so many things that people could have done differently. And everybody knows that I love John Tortorella. And I thought he um, made a really good statement about it. Um, For those of you who haven't seen it, I'd recommend you go watch his comments on it um, on TV. And um, 
he basically was saying like, I can't believe that one person, just one person didn't stand up throughout this whole process and say, this mm-hmm. is wrong. Something should have been done differently. The fact I mean, that worse, it they so made many people. fun of him, right? Yes. His own teammates used homophobic slurs against him. I it's mean, disgusting. How, it's especially during a cup run when you need to be a team and united more than ever. But again, mm-hmm. they prioritize that winning, right? Coach Q, who I've always been a huge fan of, mm-hmm. right? And, and not having known obviously that this situation went on and he was well, well aware for him to still say, well, I'm doing my job and I'm, I'm winning. We're going to go win the cup. Like that's, it's, you know, what's doing your job is standing up for your, for your players, standing up for, you know, people who come to you with a problem and fixing that problem. And John Tortorella even said, he's like, uh, you know, someone else on the panel, I can't remember who it was, was like, I would have, you know, escorted that person out the door and said, thank you. Mm -hmm. You are not welcome here anymore. And John Tortorella was like, I would have pushed him out the door. And that's, that should have been the end of it. Not only made a mistake. This is a video coach, right? It's yes. not your top assistant. It's not your head coach. It's a video coach. Like, give me an effing break. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think in not only that, and you had mentioned the resign. I hate that everybody has been allowed to resign, right? Yes. Like yep. Stan Bowman was allowed to resign. Coach Q was allowed to resign because again, you are just as culpable as Brad Aldrich in this situation. Mm-hmm. You needed, you look at, you talk about child abuse and other sexual abuse and how much we rely on people helping us and stepping forward. It's Mm -hmm. the same exact thing. It's a person person comes to you with this problem, a very serious problem and saying, Hey, this happened. There should be no, there needs to be repercussions instantly. And if you Mm -hmm. knew, and you kept that a secret for 10 years and never did anything and continue to try to cover it up once it became a little bit more public, you are completely in the wrong. You do not, you do not deserve the opportunity to step aside. Mm -hmm. You are fired. And, And again, and I, you know, I'm a big USA hockey gal, but for USA hockey to allow him to resign and step yep. aside as, as GM of the Olympic team too. No, he needs to be fired. And you need to publicly say you are fired. We are not mm-hmm. welcome in hockey. We will need to reevaluate. Cause again, you know, it's, you're just as culpable as Brad Aldridge. You are just as responsible as him, if not more, because again, you're the coach of this team or you're the yeah. owner of this team. You set the precedent for how things go on in that mm-hmm. organization. You know, we all, bow down to, to Bill Guerin because he sets a precedent for this organization. And I don't want to be remiss in not mentioning that he is under his own, Mm -hmm. um, allegations of covering up sexual abuse. There's back and forth, whether he's cleared or whether he's not. So whether USA hockey will name him the GM as right now, he's the assistant GM of that Olympic team who knows. Um, but again, you know, situations for it to be so prevalent in hockey, it's, Mm -hmm. it's so wrong. And it's so sad that it's coming out now, 10 years later, right? These are things that should have been handled right then on the spot, Stanley cup or not. I mean, yeah. you know, Rocky Wirtz, uh, as of today came out, the owner of the Blackhawks said that, you know, requested the hall of fame to remove Brad Aldrich's name from the Stanley cup. Mm-hmm. And the letter was great. And it was very forward thinking and it was wonderful, but it took this public outcry for you to even do anything. Because again, the words is no, the, the players knew, I mean, Jonathan Taves yeah. and Patrick Kane's, um, comments after the game, while I, will give them credit for speaking. Unlike coach Q after their game, mm-hmm. when this all came out, um, it was wrong. I, I, you know, you, your comments just buried them deeper. They continue to dig a grave. Like you can pretend you didn't know. And even if you did know, Oh, we weren't sure what to do. And Stan Bowman's always been great to me. You can't, that's not fair. You're taking that away mm-hmm. from Kyle beach. Now mm-hmm. you don't have the right to take away what he's experienced just because you had a good experience with that person. Right. We mm-hmm. all have those interactions with people countless times. Right. Yep. Oh, I, they're nice to me. Well, but they're a shitty person, you know, I'm yeah. sad, like, they're a shitty person and that's not okay. So the whole thing is freaking frustrating. And again, we would be remiss to not discuss it on, yeah. on this and, and everyone has their opinions, but I do feel like for once the entire hockey community kind of is all on the same page. Yes. That's a big middle yes. finger to Brad Aldrich and to the Chicago Blackhawk organization. Like it, it was a failure from top to bottom. And mm-hmm. again, round of applause and all the hugs to Kyle beach and and his family for being able to come forward and, and to, you know, talk about this and say, this is wrong. I mean, for Kyle to have broken down and apologized to the mission, that was the hardest part of the video. At, knowing yeah. that Brad Aldrich went, I mean, cause again, that's where the failure happened. Brad Aldrich continued to be a part of the hockey community. He continued to be a part of USA hockey. He went on to sexually abuse then a teenager in Michigan. Like that's why this is so wrong. You need Mm -hmm. to cut that leg off the moment that it happens because he needs to get help. He needs to be locked up. He needs to not be anywhere where he could do this again. And Mm -hmm. for Kyle beach to take on that responsibility and feel so heartbroken, especially when he did everything right. He did what he was, Yeah, you know, like guys, this is not okay. This in, you know, and in hockey, it is, unfortunately, it's still 
fosters a very homophobic culture, I Mm -hmm. feel right. And we've had Brock McGillis on, on the podcast to talk about that. And it is, it's, it's, it's sad that that that's so hard to come forward and say, Hey, you know, this happened to me, you know, as mm-hmm. a man, I, I imagine it's, it's hard for anybody and, and victims never want to come forward, but oh, okay. I'll take a break. If you would like to say anything, cause I do, I mean, it gets, it, I it, it's yeah. Fred, what do you, yeah, I, your think, I think my biggest thing is like the results and everything happened 2012, 2013 was the timeline. Yeah. And I know it doesn't seem that long ago, but the amount of like dominoes that have fallen when it comes to me too and sexual assaults and victims coming forward and having that bravery is incredible to look back at how many things have happened between now and then. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, just, you know, one of the biggest stories I've ever heard of when I was in college was the Sandusky shit at Mm -hmm. Penn state, you know, and big famous coach Rick Pitino being taken down, you know, statues being removed out of the ground because of his lack of action to take mm-hmm. against Sandusky. And then you've got the Larry Nasser and every single mm-hmm. gymnast that stepped forward in front of Congress mm-hmm. to talk about what happened to them during the Olympics, right before gold medal meets. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's kind of crazy that, that Kyle Beach is standing on the shoulders of Simone Biles mm-hmm. and Michaela Maroney mm-hmm. and all those other gymnasts that were sexual assaulted by Larry Nasser And it, 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 it is crazy that we're still dealing with this, mm-hmm. but it's time. And I'm proud that, that Kyle Beach was able to step forward yeah. and be brave enough and stand on the shoulders of the others who have changed the world. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think the, one of the things that makes me so angry is Kyle Beach was just a young kid trying to like make it in the NHL, right? Just like any of us in our careers, trying to find the path to success and doing what we want to do in life. Even if it's not your career, like whatever your passion is to succeed in, in life, we all have our certain paths that we go down to try to get to that point. And he was so early on in his path to success, um, you know, in the NHL as a hockey player, as a man, like he was still growing up too. I mean, there's so many things that when this happened, it completely altered the course of his life and nobody knew. I mean, people talked about how he was a failed draft pick and oh, look at him. He didn't succeed. Like everyone thought he was going to. And to me, this is just a reminder to everybody that you, you have no idea what is going on behind the doors of somebody's life. And it's easy to judge. It's easy to say, Oh, that person did that. Well, what a failure. That person didn't do this. What a failure. And And yes, you are entitled to, to make your, you know, have opinions about things that happen in life. But at the end of the day, when something like this came out, that was one of the most heartbreaking things to me is knowing that his life was like literally changed forever. And this wasn't just one moment in time and, oh yeah, it was a bad thing and it happened and it was over and done with. No, this was a domino effect that literally ruined his life. And he's just now, he said this several times, I'm just now starting the process of healing. After 10 years, can you imagine at his age through 10 years, trying to process everything that happened and then having this happen and then trying to process it all over again? I mean, he, I just, I can't even fathom and I'm glad I can't, but I I can't even fathom the pain that he is dealing with right now and the relief at the same time. I mean, I'm sure there's so many things going through his body and his head, um, that is going to take him so, so long to process like traumatic things, uh, tend to do. And, um, Yeah. It's just, I I had a lot of, a lot of anger for the fact that it wasn't just a one moment in time thing that, that affected his life. It was a domino effect that, that literally changed his life for the worse. And that to me was one of the hardest things, uh, you know, in, in conjunction with the lack of action by all of the people, all of the people who knew what happened and didn't do anything about it is severely, severely disappointing. Um, and that absolutely needs to change. And I hope that what Kyle did by telling his story. Um, and I've seen so many people say this, but I hope that him coming forward and saying what happened gives other people at the very least the courage to start to heal from what they're going through. Even if they don't have the same kind of public experience that he had with this, he helped so many people the other day by telling his story and being brave enough to do so. Um, so I have so much respect for him for that and respect to the hockey community. Like Jesse said, it's not too often that everyone's on the same page when it comes to sports. Everybody was on the same page the other day. And that no matter what you feel about the hockey world and what is going on in the hockey world right now, I felt pride in the hockey community that day for everyone standing up and saying, this is wrong and something needs to change. Um, so kudos to the reporters, to the media people, to the fans, to everybody who in some way, shape or form 
said, this is wrong because that's where the change actually starts. And hopefully it doesn't take too long to get to a point where this is a better community for people like Kyle. Um, but it needs to get to that point at some point and some point soon. And that process started the other day. And I hope we only continue to move forward after that. I mean, we talk about the desperate, desperate need for the hockey culture to change, right? We talk about inclusivity um, for Blacks and Latin Americans and Mm -hmm. and whoever wants to play, right? Like we we stress the importance of that, but that extends to any homophobic things. Because again, I think that's also what strikes me. It's like, well, we kept this covered and it's all hush hush because it's a guy on a guy. And oh, yeah, like, I mean, I think, again, it's you need to prioritize human rights over mm-hmm. winning and over what you've always known. And and I hope this again, shakes the hockey world. I mean, Stan Bowman's been a part of the hockey community forever and coach Q has been renowned in the mm-hmm. hockey world forever. And to see them fall, like it's not that you want to see the successful people crumble, but at the same time, it's important to knock some of those pillars down in order for mm-hmm. change to make and make examples of them. Right. So it's another step toward truly changing hockey for the better. Not, I'm not saying I want to change every single aspect, mm-hmm. but so much of it needs to change in order for it just to be better and to have more people appreciate and, and see the game for what it is, which is a truly great, pure game. But that means the culture and the community need to be rocked a little bit too. So i um, super glad that we were able to take some time out today to, to discuss this again, so incredibly proud of, of Kyle beach mm-hmm. and, and everything that he has done to, to be a voice and, and really stand up. I, I can only imagine it's going to continue to be a difficult journey for him, but you know, hopefully he, his healing process is on a expedited road now with, uh, with the findings. So certainly let us know which, what, what you guys think. Um, I know a lot of you guys have tapped into our comments about it mm-hmm. and, and we completely agree. And we talk about it in this week's cues with the buttes as well. Cause I know a lot of people have had a hard time understanding this you know and and it's hard because sexual assault does affect a lot of people uh, you know so it's it's a difficult topic but one that's important to talk about and uh, again kudos to uh to kyle beach we're gonna take a quick break when we come back up for debate stay tuned Hey, everybody, this is producer Fred. I just want to make sure everybody was up to date on every single thing that's going on with Bar Down Beauties for season three. We've got shirts coming out. We've got some sweepstakes. We've got some announcements. Like, follow, share. You'll be right on top of all the news. We're back. Now moving on to one of our very favorite segments, Up for Debate. This week, we discuss the biggest surprise in the Central Division, whether that's good, bad, or the other way. Would it be the Minnesota Wild off to what was kind of a hot start? Still a Mm -hmm. decent start. The uh, Colorado Avalanche, Alexis, I don't know why you put them in there, but uh, sure. Because they're not at the top of the division because the Wild are up there. (laughs) Or the Chicago Blackhawks, who some people thought were going to be really good. And not only are a terrible organization, (laughs) but also really, really bad. So, uh, Alexis, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I, my choice here would be the wild. Um, and everybody knows I'm always rooting for the wild to succeed. I put him at the top of the central division. I just like to say stuff sometimes. I mean, I do like partially believe most of what I say, but at the same time, I just like to stir the pot. Um, I, I didn't actually think the wild were like truly going to win the division. I'm like, I'm just going to say this because it's a hot take and I love the wild. So go wild, win the division. But you did. Um, think that, so I do think that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, when they got off to the start that they have, and we're recording this on a Friday, they're five and two at this point in time coming off a loss against Seattle, uh, won their first, um, four games of the season. Yes. Jesse has a lovely, um, record five and two. There behind you. So um, I remember because <laughs> otherwise I forget. Yeah. Um, they started off the season really hot, uh, you know, with four, um, four wins. And to me, it was surprising because they went through such turnover in their lineup in the off season that not that I didn't think the wild were going to like fail this season. Like I thought they, I still think they're going to have a successful season. I think they're a playoff team. Um, I think they're, you know, competitive. Um, and I think they're going to give a lot of teams a run for their money in the regular season and hopefully in the playoffs as well. Um, but to see them start off like so hot was a little bit surprising to me. I kind of expected them to be like maybe a 500 team at this point in the season, you know, after about 10 games or so. Um, so yeah, I was a little bit surprised to see the wild start off the way they did. And especially because 
they spent most of the first handful of games battling back, you know, from behind, like they're chasing the game. They're trying to pick up wins. They start the season on the road, like all of this stuff where it's like, this really wouldn't be in their favor for a team who's had a lot of turnover um, and whatnot. So the fact that they were able to pick up so many wins and still sit with a pretty good record here after seven games um, has been impressive. Now there's still a lot of teams they haven't played yet that I'm like, okay, that's going to be a good test of what kind of team that this Minnesota wild team is. Love it. Um, so I'm going to wait to see how they perform. You know, they played Colorado on Saturday here. You guys are listening to this after that game happened. We're recording it before, um, but a team like that's going to be a good test. They haven't played St. Louis yet who they struggled against last season. Um, some of those, um, East, uh, Eastern teams that they don't see very often that are very, very good. Uh, they play Pittsburgh this upcoming week. So there's a lot of teams where I'm like, all right, I really need to see how they play against them. But at this point in time, I am slightly surprised with the wilds winning record, uh, just cause I expected them more 500. Jesse, we know what your answer is, but take it away. <laughs> I just hate everything about the Chicago Blackhawks now. <laughs> no, I mean, I thought they were going to be sneaky good and they are so bad. They are sneaky, really bad. Like awful. <laughs> I've never really seen bad. like, <laughs> I mean, there's bad. And then there's Chicago Blackhawks bad, right? Yeah. Like, holy cow. I, I can't even make sense of it. You have Mark Andre Fleury. You've got a, mm-hmm. a, well, I guess Patrick Kane's out on protocol right now. Right. But you have like him still being him. Jonathan Taze was healthy. Like Debrinket's looking great. Like what? they picked up Seth Jones in the off season. Like, like, yeah, like, the, yeah. Yeah. Like they shouldn't be as bad. I mean, maybe it was a stretch to say like they would sneak into the playoffs there, but I didn't think they'd be like awful. So now I'm looking like a fool. I'm quitting again for like the third time in this episode, because I clearly don't know hockey clearly don't know what I'm talking about. Um, so definitely them, I would say honorable mention though, too, to the St. Louis blues who I'm shocked are doing as well as they are doing. Like I did not see that coming. I figured they would be normal St. Louis, right? Like kind of up and down, blah, blah, blah. Kind of like the wild almost. Yeah. Yeah. Like they're crushing it. They're score. I mean, I'm nervous for the wild to face the blues for the first time because not only is that historically a very tough matchup, but they're, they're looking awesome. So I would say they're also a big old surprise to me. Everybody else is pretty much what I expected, I guess, minus them in Chicago. Yeah. Can we talk for a second about how Jordan Bennington like is like literally like what is wrong with cannon? him? Do we need to, do we need to get help? Like he's he a just mood. Fill us like, in. This is your team. He's what a is mood. Wrong with Jordan That's Bennington? all he is. He's just yes. a mood and he has a hot head. That's all it is. Like he's see Kadri, and Darcy even... Kemper. Are they like sharing game notes or what? What is their problem? I mean, I just love, did you see him swinging his yeah, hockey yes. stick? I'm like, he whoa, is, he is a goalie <laughs> version of Sean Avery. Like was Sean Avery yes. reincarnated into Jordan Bennington's body? Like, I don't understand. It's just a child thought process. And then Kadri got the penalty for it too. And he's like, I got yes. a penalty for talking. Apparently like it's just, it, he's it, a child that led a team to a Stanley cup. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I guess he had, it went works. to his head and he now, went, now he's got issues. He went after Dubnik last year. Remember too, like yes. they got into like, it. He does Do this it. stuff all the time. It's just so bizarre to me, but I don't know, whatever. So those are surprises. Let us know your surprises. A lot of people said, what Alexis, what were a lot of people um, thinking? A lot of, a lot of people were saying wild. Yeah. Um, Chicago. yeah mostly everybody knew Chicago was going to be bad. Probably. Yeah. Except- yeah. Um, not many people said Colorado, but like I said, I just threw them in there because they're like, everyone has them to win the central. So I'm like, well, no, they're not up there I right saw now. That. So. I was like, what, what about Colorado? I, but I admittedly have not paid nearly enough attention to Colorado yet yeah. just because they've kind of been whatever. So who knows, but, uh, another good one. Stay tuned for more up for debates every week on our social media channel. Be sure to go check out our cues with the buttes. You guys asked some good ones this week. That's a YouTube exclusive. That's going to do it for this week. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed our new approach, our little guestless approach to discuss some, some big topics. We do have an awesome guest coming in next week. Uh, so be sure to stay tuned for that. I know I'm super pumped. Fred doesn't know yes. who this person is, so he'll probably young Alexis is week. very excited. I mean, yes. adult Alexis is excited too, but like Alexis has a child. If you would have told her that she would get to interview this person when she was 26, she'd have been thriving. So yeah, there's so a that's your, hint. that's your hint that, and Fred doesn't know this person. That's your other hint. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Fred, oh, no, gracious. you are not allowed on the record. Oh next my week. God. Fired. Um, <laughs> yeah. So stay tuned for that. Be sure to head over to our YouTube page to check out our cues with the buttes, which is a YouTube exclusive. You guys had some good ones this week for us. We appreciate that. Um, shout out to talk North. We appreciate you for featuring us on your network. Uh, soda stick.com. Don't forget 15% off with code bar down beauties on those Marcus Delino fan club shirts, uh, where a portion is donated to Marcus's mom's foundation as well. The Janice Felino foundation. Uh, I want to see more of those Felino fan club mm-hmm. shirts walking around. I know they're still getting mailed out, so don't worry, but, uh, certainly shoot a picture of yourself at the game or watching yeah. whatever it may be. 
uh because I, I do get a kick out of, of seeing those that's pretty awesome yeah. uh shout out so sick for that better edge b-e-t-t-r edge.com a free 10 bucks when you use code buttes b-a-u-t-s place your wild bets place your football bets all of that good stuff and be on the lookout for a beat the butte uh competition starting up pretty quickly here i believe jim beam cheers to you cheers to me i am still working on some good jim beam recipes so if you have that <laughs> please send that our way as well. And uh, Tony Hoagland at statefarminsurance.com. That's going to do it. Uh, Hopefully you guys all have a fantastic week. Hopefully Halloween treated you well. (laughs) And uh, we'll see you in November because that's when the next recording is going to be. October's over, guys. Rip. Rip. So is this episode. Okay, bye. (laughs) Great sign off. Thank you.